Well, good morning. I'm Father Paul Scalia. Uh, know many of you already from, well, from our own chapter in the Diocese of Arlington and also from past uh, conferences. And so good to see so many of you again. Uh, Father Check has asked me to um, sort of be the, uh, I guess, the host or the master of ceremonies for the talks today. And so I have the privilege of introducing this morning's first speaker, Bishop Olmsted. Bishop Olmsted was a uh, ordained priest for the Diocese of Lincoln, as Bishop of uh, Wichita, and then uh, now as uh, Bishop of Phoenix, Arizona. And as I think many of you know, he is a very strong voice for Catholic truth, uh, Catholic doctrine and morality, and being in Phoenix, he is uh, literally a voice crying out in the desert. Uh, <laughs> he, He's been a longtime, longtime friend and supporter of courage, uh, really in, encouraging it a great deal in the Diocese of, of Phoenix, and one of his priests is here uh, as well with him to benefit from the conference as well. And so we are privileged to have uh, the first two speakers of the conference last night, uh, Cardinal Burke, and then this morning, Bishop Olmsted, uh, privileged to have two very strong uh, and uh, uh, solid voices for, uh, the, for Catholic truth, uh, the truth that truly frees us. And so I ask you to please welcome Bishop Olmsted. Thank you, Father Scalia. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy to be with you today. And I'm uh, grateful for the invitation from Father Czech to be with you, to speak to you today, also to celebrate the Eucharist with you before I fly on to Kansas to be with my family for a few days of vacation. I'm blessed yet that my parents, both 89, are still dancing on Sunday nights. <laughs> and uh, we have our family reunion the first Sunday of August every year. So um, that's what I'm flying home to be, be there for. This morning I'm going to speak a little bit about the virtue of faith. And um, I do this partly because I'm struck by the fact that when Jesus um, was frustrated, I would say, with the lack of response to him, he spoke about this faithless generation. And it struck me that of the theological virtues, he doesn't say the loveless generation or the hopeless generation, but the faithless generation. And it's made me ponder about what, it is, what is it that most gets in the way of God working through the likes of you and me? And what virtue is most needed so that he can? And that beautiful prayer, which we just prayed from blessed St. John Newman, I think, is a great example of, of a faith-filled prayer that um, recognizes that God desires to shine through us and to work through us. So I'll say a few words in general about virtue, and then a few words about the uh, virtue of faith. I'd like to begin with a description of Dorothy Day. A number of you, I'm sure, are aware of Dorothy Day. Uh, for a number of years of her life, she would not have been called a virtuous person. But she became a virtuous person. And um, when she died, someone said of her, she lived as though the truth were true. That's virtue. To live as though the truth were true. Whatever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters you do for me, those words of Jesus became ingrained within her heart and in her mind. And so she fed the hungry and assisted the poor in a heroically loving fashion. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, she developed the perfected ability to place her considerable talents, especially of journalism, of practicality, and of great charity for the least ones at the service of the gospel and, and our country. 
she became a woman of virtue. The Catechism describes virtue in this way. A virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. It continues, virtue allows a person not only to perform good acts, but to give the best of himself. He pursues the good and chooses it in concrete actions. So that simple but direct explanation of what a virtue is from the Catechism I think is helpful for us. It builds an integrity of life and a strength of character that helps us to live what St. Saint Paul exhorts us to live. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, St. Paul writes, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen." End quote. We often, when we think of Christian morality, we think of the Ten Commandments and of the Eight Beatitudes, and that's very appropriate. Uh, you probably have seen uh, there is uh, a man in Kansas City who has helped to erect many of the Ten Commandments on, on a large, usually, uh, slab of, of marble or something like that. On one side and the other side will have the, uh, the Eight Beatitudes, which I think is an excellent witness to the Christian heritage and to have that in public places. But to put these into practice in our moral life is what virtue helps us to do. It helps us move beyond the knowledge of what's right and true and good to the daily practice of that in our lives. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we certainly cannot do it on our own, but with the help of the Holy Spirit and repeated efforts day after day on our part, we can keep the commandments, we can live the Beatitudes, we can become holy and virtuous, every one of us. In the way of that, of course, is original sin. So every single one of us has great obstacles that stand before us, that we've all inherited. And then we also have our own laziness and our own um, lack of uh, virtue that gets in the way. But with the Holy Spirit and with our own effort, we can forge these virtues. And those help us put on the mind and the heart of Jesus Christ. Uh, just as a little review, as you know, we usually speak about two sets of virtues, the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues. And uh, the cardinal virtues come from that Latin word cardo. The word cardo means hinge. So if you have a door without a hinge, you are in trouble. It's either not going to stay shut or it's not going to stay open. The hinge is what allows it to work properly. And when we do, when we have the cardinal virtues, what we have is our life is not unhinged. It helps us to be able to keep our life moving in the right direction. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 8, verse 7, lists the four cardinal virtues, moderation and prudence, justice and fortitude. These are the greater of the, what we call the human virtues. But then in addition to those is the three theological virtues. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the human virtues are rooted in the theological virtues. They're called theological because they, are, they have the one and triune God for their origin, 
their motive, and their object. They are infused by God into the souls of the faithful to make them capable of acting as his children and of meriting eternal life. This is amazing, huh? God infuses within us the theological virtues. So that's not, it's not ourselves that gets them there. They, they are something that come from God. And then they help us to, to be motivated toward God, to keep God at the center of our life. And then they help us to keep God as the object of our life. St. Paul frequently talks about the theological virtues in his epistles. For example, to the Galatians, he writes, chapter 5, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor incircumcision consists, counts for anything, but only faith working through love. To the Christians of Thessalonica, he writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8, Let us be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet that is hope for salvation. And to the Corinthians, he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, so faith, hope, love remain. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Without a doubt, there's a close connection between these theological virtues and the cardinal virtues and the other virtues as well. After all, how could you be a person of strong faith, sincere love, and persevering hope if you were foolish, unjust, cowardly, and undisciplined? So the four cardinal virtues obviously allow us to really live the theological virtues. The cardinal virtues, in other words, are not sufficient in themselves. Justice cannot come to perfection without charity. And courage will fail without hope. Even more importantly, only with the grace of God can we do what is right and live with integrity the faith that we profess. There is this necessary interconnection between the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues. As we know, it takes constant formation and constant effort to live a life of virtue. And in our individualistic society, such repeated striving can appear to some to be a waste of time, as if it's not possible to become a virtuous person. I remember the, a few months before I was ordained a priest, the librarian at the North American College in Rome, where I was a seminarian, said to me, remember, Thomas, the most diabolical of all temptations is discouragement. I remember going right up to my room, getting out my journal, and writing that down. <laughs> I had a sense I needed to remember this. And I think that's true. The most diabolical of all temptations is discouragement, which makes us think we cannot be virtuous. The virtues are gifts from God, theological virtues, and all of them are possible only because of God's grace, but that's exactly what he gives us and exactly what he wants <coughs> us to receive and to put into our lives. In our present culture, which has given all of us a taste of the hollowness of a me generation and knows the lack of meaning that results from selfishness that's promoted so much in the media and especially in advertising. Virtuous living becomes a deeply desired goal. The virtues are indispensable for integrity and for joy in life. So today I want to speak to you about the virtue of faith, the theological virtue of faith. And I'd like to do that through the lens of the life of blessed John Paul II. When Pope Benedict beatified his predecessor on May 1st of this year, 
he said this, John Paul II is blessed because of his faith. A strong, generous, and apostolic faith. That made me uh, reflect a lot about John Paul. I had the privilege of being the Secretary of State, working with him in the secretarial staff in a little more than nine of his first ten years that he was the successor of St. Peter, and had the great privilege of being inspired constantly by his life and by his humility and courage. And he's known for so many virtues. But in his homily at his beatification, while he mentioned those, such as the joyful witness in the face of suffering, his spiritual fatherhood, so badly needed and so striking because even when, when atheists greeted him, they called him Holy Father, <laughs> which says something about an incredible fatherhood that our world lacks and needs. Certainly a virtue that he lives so well. Because he had such a deep confidence in the mercy of God and promoted the divine mercy, devotion, with so many virtues that could be picked out. But it's very striking to me that Pope Benedict, who has such a love and admiration and works so closely as well with Pope Benedict or with Pope John Paul before becoming his successor, that he's picked up on this fact that the greatest virtue of John Paul was his faith. He said that Blessed John Paul followed the example of the Virgin Mother of God, of whom Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who believed. Uh, when John Paul II became the successor of St. Peter, he uh, only made one change in the chapel, the little chapel that's in the papal apartments. Uh, and in that chapel, there was one very striking feature of it. That chapel had been redone during the time of Pope Paul VI. And if you've ever had the privilege of being in the chapel, you'll notice that Christ on the cross does not wear a crown of thorns. And that's because the, uh, the um, artist who did that during that time, when asked by Pope Paul VI, where is the crown of thorns? He said, you are wearing the crown of thorns, a successor of Peter in our day. So that's a very striking feature about that crucifix in front of the, uh, of the chapel there in the papal apartments. John Paul II added only one thing. Underneath the, the left arm of Christ on the cross, he put the little icon of Our Lady of Chestahova. Very appropriate when you recognize that his own coat of arms just has the cross and the M for Mary in the same position. So if John Paul II's virtue, the greatest virtue in his life was faith, it's because he saw that in Mary. Blessed is she who believed, as Elizabeth said, of Mary. And that he had the sense that that was really such a critical part of his being a man of God and his following his own vocation and unique mission in the church in our day. The Holy Father called upon Blessed John Paul II at the last part of his homily in these words. Blessed are you, beloved John Paul II, because you believed. Continue, we implore you, to sustain from heaven the faith of God's people. So that's what I'd like to focus on now, the virtue of faith. Faith is truly a blessing. The Lord Jesus calls it a pearl of great price, worthy of any sacrifice, even if one must sell all he has to obtain it. Whoever has faith has found a precious treasure. In our world today, however, every believer encounters formidable obstacles to faith. I remember when I was studying French, living with a French family in Tours in France. And um, 
I became friends with, a, with an Irishman who was studying there as well, who had a girlfriend from Thailand. And one day, uh, I, I only met her on two occasions that I remember. The first time I met her, um, I had gone, I, I was just a student there, and, and my Irish friend, whom I met while there, uh, introduced me to his girlfriend. Within about five seconds, she said to me, with this real uh, ugly face. <laughs> she wasn't ugly, but she made her face ugly for me. <laughs> Sometimes I have the ability to draw this out of people. <laughs> she said, do you believe that he's present in that piece of bread? with this ugly face and this real strong statement. And I, you know, I just met her. <laughs> <laughs> never, never seen her before. <laughs> so uh, I kind of took this deep breath and I said, yes. <laughs> And that was the last word she said to me. <laughs> in the world today, every believer encounters formidable obstacles to faith. It's not a world that affirms believing in God. Some of these are linked to the limitations of mind. Things in our society bring up doubts and fears that probably most of us have felt quite significantly. Some of them stem from temptations of the devil that we can be pretty confident that they're coming from the evil one. And still others come from, you might call philosophical forces of society, such as those that are named so clearly by Pope Benedict, secularism and relativism. Faith is also challenged, as we know, by scandals within the church, of which we are all more than familiar. One of the practices that I have to this day is to meet any time um, that I am aware of someone who's been abused by a member of the church. So I frequently have these meetings. And one of the constants the, those who have been abused by a member of the church, especially by a priest, have, is that they find it very hard to believe in God after having that experience. And that's why I, I uh, make it very clear that this is something that I am, um, would like to do, because often they're helped. There's only been one person whom I've met with who's been abused by a, a member of the, of the church who has not, at the end of the meeting, been willing to pray with me, which is often a big step from where they were when they came into the room. That's a major problem there. So all of us know scandals within the church, which um, break our own hearts, also are an obstacle to many at the present time. So in the face of all these obstacles to faith, it's good to remember that God never allows us to face more than we can handle. And he allows us to face obstacles for our good. This is the way in a world broken by original sin that we are able to grow. Because it moves us to rely on things that you can't hold in your hand, but can only hold in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. So keeping those things in mind, let's just recall briefly the three main elements of faith which work harmoniously together. So the Catechism said there's three, three elements of faith. The first is trust. The second is assent, A-S-S-E-N-T. And the third is obedience. I'll consider each of these now briefly. 
And I'll look to Blessed John Paul II as an example of someone who incorporated each of these three elements into his life of faith. The first is trust. As we know, this is the one that receives the most attention in the Old Testament of the Bible. In particular, Abraham is its great prototype. And this is why in the first Eucharistic prayer, the one we call the Roman Canon, he's called our Father in faith. And what an amazing trust he had in God. Recall how he left behind his country of origin, his father and mother and, all, and his friends, all that he knew and all that he loved, all that was familiar and comfortable. Uh, Archbishop Gomez is a good friend of mine from uh, Los Angeles. And um, he says that when he has, when, he, when people come to visit him, he takes them to a place where they can have tacos and donuts because he likes to combine the cultures. <laughs> well, whatever kind of food Abraham liked, he wasn't going to find that probably when he went to the new place. Everything that's familiar was no longer going to be familiar. All these unknowns. Moreover, God did not tell Abraham where he was going to lead him, or what he would do there. He just told him, I will show you the land I intend to give you. That's all he told him. And Abraham trusted. And then as we know, years later, a much greater test of his faith was required. And this was with what he thought was a call from God to sacrifice his only son. After he had waited years, and it seemed as if he and Sarah were beyond the years where they could have a son, could have a child. And then they were given Isaac. And then one day he hears what he thinks is God's call to uh, sacrifice Isaac. And so that whole um, dramatic scene that becomes, of course, the icon, almost, of what Jesus does. The wood is put on the back of Isaac, just as the cross is put on the back of Jesus to carry to the place of Calvary. And then when they get there, um, as he prepares to, to take the life of his son, on the, now attached to the wood, as Jesus was attached to the wood, um, he stopped and uh, his son is restored to him, of course. Uh, as the fathers of the church reminded us, this is the, what God the Father did not do in his own case. He gave us his only son. But then he found this ram, so the lamb of God. Already there you have this image. And then the ram is offered up on the wood. And Jesus becomes the lamb of God later. But even here, to the very last moment, Abraham trusted the Lord. When it seemed as if, all of his, everything that gave greatest meaning in his life and all of the promises that God had made to him, which were through his descendants, that they would be like the sand on the seashore, would come through Isaac and how this could go forth. And yet he trusted God. John Paul II was a man of great trust in the love of God. And he had a sense that this was what would was most needed for us in our time. I had the privilege of standing there in the square when he was elected. I was a student at the time in Rome. And uh, when the smoke came out of the little chimney at the top of the Sistine Chapel, as we were standing there, we didn't know whether it was white or not, which has been a problem, as you know, if you've watched <laughs> these things especially because it was after dark, it was the second ballot in the evening, and they had this big spotlight shining on it, which made it look white no matter what color it was. <laughs> so when finally they came out and announced in Italian that it is indeed white, we were all so excited. And many people had the newspapers opened up with the 50 to 60 to 100 <laughs> photographs of those likely candidates. <laughs> 
Carol Wojtyla was not on any one of those <laughs> at all. None of them. And then when he's announced, they announce that he's the bishop of, and they said it in Italian, Polonia. Well, one of the main candidates was from Bologna <laughs> in Italy. So the Italians around us were so excited <laughs> that an Italian had been chosen. But when he spoke, it didn't have an accent, <laughs> like Bologna. That was the 16th of October. The 22nd which was the day when he officially begins the inauguration of his pontificate. He gave that wonderful, wonderful homily. And what he told us, what he was convinced about, and I'm sure especially he prayed from the 16th to the 22nd, what did we most need to hear in 1978? at this point in the church's history. And the words that, that he said, which he repeated till the day he died, be not afraid, do not fear to open the door of your home to Christ. Open your heart to him, open your business to him, open your nation to him. Do not be afraid to welcome him into your life. That's trust. If anyone in the 20th century had a reason to be a man of fear and distrustful of God, it was Carol Wojtyla. He suffered the loss of every member of his family before he was 21. His only sister died before he was born. His mother died three weeks before his first communion. I can't imagine what his heart felt like when he went up to receive Christ for the first time. His father took him and his brother Edmund, who was many years older than Carol Wojtyla, to a shrine of Our Lady. And there he poured out, they together poured out their sorrow. And then when he was 12, his dear brother Edmund, who had just finished medical school and gone out to serve, contracted disease and died within a few days. And his father and he did the same thing. They went and prayed to Our Lady and found strength there. And then just as the Nazis had crushed Germany, his father died. He and his father were living together at that stage. And then he saw his country crushed under Nazism. One third of all the priests and religious were killed. Many of his best friends were killed because, as you know, he had many Jewish friends. He says that he had many Jewish friends because he wasn't good enough for the Catholic soccer team. <laughs> so in Varovice, where he grew up, he was the goalie for the Jewish team, <laughs> which is a great gift. Who was the pope who opened up official relations between Israel and the Holy See? John Paul II one of his best friends from the soccer team, who was still a close friend, Jerzy Kluger, helped that to come about. The first pope since Peter to visit the synagogue in Rome, John Paul II. No such thing as coincidence, he would say. Um, but to see over half of the Jewish people, many of these friends killed in Auschwitz, the Germans built the biggest of their extermination camps in Poland. And so to see that over and over, his own uh, best friends, his one seminary classmate in the underground seminary in which he entered, being uh, killed by the Nazis. And then, after Nazism is defeated, Russian communism takes over. And so all of that oppression on him. But instead of losing hope, instead he be of becoming a cynic or a pessimist, he grew in faith and trust in God's grace. He had this great, great trust in the love of God. And it seemed that nothing frightened him. George Weigel says, it's not that he never faced fears, it's rather that he faced them in faith and he learned to live beyond fears because he trusted in the love of Christ to be stronger than evil and more powerful than death. 
uh, I had the privilege on occasion to have mass with him there early in the morning in that chapel. And when you went in and, and were there with him praying, his whole body would be into his prayer. He would, he would um, you'd, you'd see him uh, kind of, if you've been to the Wailing Wall at Jerusalem and seen people moving, that's the way that, that he was. There was an intensity about his prayer. Um, of like he was oblivious to the rest of us who were praying with him there in the room before Mass began. And that's, I think, where he brought the weight of the papacy and placed it in God's hands. And when he got up, it seemed as if any doubts and any fears were totally gone. And this radiant sense of the love of God was able to pour forth from him. And that's how he could say, open the doors of your heart to Christ. Be not afraid. So that's the first quality of faith. It trusts God, no matter what. The second is assent to God's word. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it this way. Faith is, first of all, a personal adherence of a man to God. At the same time, so that's trust, at the same time and inseparably, it is a free assent to the whole truth that God has revealed. So notice how the Catechism does this link immediately between trust and assent. To believe in God means to assent to all that God reveals, to accept it entirely as true and worthy of all one's trust. Now obviously this assent to faith relies on God's infinite knowledge and God's truthfulness. So we believe God cannot deceive, that he will not deceive, and he cannot be deceived. And that's why we rejoice in Jesus' words, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's what faith gives us, the light of life. And that's why we say yes to God, because we're just convinced that what he tells us is true even if we don't understand it yet. With grateful hearts, we profess together the creed at Sunday Mass. Uh, this is a prayer. We don't just profess it together because it's helpful to us, but it's a prayer when we say together the creed. It expresses our deepest identity and our convictions. At the same time, we do well to remember St. Thomas Aquinas' words. The believer's act of faith does not terminate in the propositions, but in the realities which they express. So we use the words, but much greater than that are, are what is the reality that they are pointing toward as we profess our faith. It's an ascent to the reality of God himself. And this is certainly true for blessed John Paul. When Father Carol Wojtyla became a bishop, he had to choose an Episcopal motto. And he decided on two Latin words, totus tuus. Uh, there's, of course, that ancient Latin hymn to the Blessed Virgin Mary, which I'm sure uh, he was thinking of very much. And I think he saw himself as imitating Mary. And just as Mary placed her whole life at the service of, of Christ and the gospel, so he wished to do. But those words are crucial to the ascent of faith. Totus tuus. The ascent of mind to all that God reveals. There's no room in faith for cafeteria Catholicism. There's no room for picking and choosing what you will accept and what you will not accept. That's the total opposite of faith. Because what I'm doing there is I'm deciding I'm smarter than God. And so I'll say, OK, take that one and that one. And I don't like that. I'll take that one. So who's smarter here? So that's the ascent of faith has to be total or it's not faith. So anytime we pick and choose, we are acting directly opposite to the ascent of faith. 
One, other, one either believes all God reveals is true and all his church teaches as infallibility, or one does not have the Catholic faith. Joseph Pieper, who's written some of the best things on the virtues, both the theological and cardinal virtues, says, belief can never be half-hearted. And you know, our skeptical society makes it very hard to be whole-hearted. Skepticism, which is so prominent, plants these doubts and it makes us want to be selective. Blessed John Paul II, strong faith, led him to write the theology of the body. Do you know the, the, I love this part about the theology of the body. When he came to Rome for the consistory that would elect him as Pope, he was working on this document. So he brought it with him to the consistory so he could finish it. You know what it was? Theology of the body. So while everyone is there praying and asking the Holy Spirit to direct them to, to um, who should be chosen successor, he's trying to finish this work so he can publish it when he gets back to Krakow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, in the middle of his commas and periods and <laughs> rewriting it, he got elected. And then he had to decide what to do with this. But why did he decide? Why, in the midst of an election of a new pope, where he knew this is a major responsibility of itself as a cardinal, why did he, why was he working on theology of the body? Why was it that the topic that he most often dealt with from the time of his second year as a priest, way back in, what, 1946, was marriage? And he said the key, the key things, he, he was a university student chaplain in that after one year of being in a little country parish. And he said the key questions that came up in the lives of the young people were what is love, what is truth, and what is freedom? And he said these came forward because they were trying to search out what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? How do, how do we discover in our life truth and goodness and beauty and love? And so that led him to, to be pursuing what became eventually the theology of the body. But he also did it because from afar he witnessed rejection of Humanae Vitae in 1968. And once you had rejection of the church's teaching, if you can reject one part, then you really have lost hope in the everything. So that the preaching and teaching of the church, as we see, happened, sadly, in most of the, of, of the world, especially the free world, uh, was, was doubts about the church's teaching. Um, I remember Bishop Austin Vaughn, uh, who was the head of the Catholic Theological Society of America in 1968, and um, the vice president that year was Charles Curran. Uh, Father Charles Curran became the leading dis dissident to that church's teaching. Bishop of St. Vaughan became the leading one supporting that teaching. He wrote 20 years later that what happened after Humanae Vitae was that most priests did not teach against it. They just lost confidence that it was good news. So they fell silent. And the result of that, of course, is a, a, a silence when, when the sexual revolution was thrusting confused notions about sexuality, about what it means to be a woman and a man, all around us. And most of us priests fell silent at that time. But who didn't? This archbishop, priest, then bishop at the time, 1968, already an archbishop in Poland, looking from all of his experience at this world and deciding we needed new presentation of, of Humanae Vitae in a way that was more convincing. Why did he do that? Because of assent, of faith. He was a man of faith, and he knew that until we can wholeheartedly and gladly give our whole assent to everything the church is teaching, something will be deeply lacking within us. So the theology of the body comes from that conviction. Let's move to the third element of faith, obedience of faith. Faith commits us to obey God, 
to put what we believe into action. Sometimes it costs us dearly. For example, when Carol Wojtyla was elected pope, he had to let go of all of his own plans. He had to surrender everything into the hands of God. You know, you're elected pope and you never go back home again. Um, all of your thoughts, everything that you thought you were going to do the next day, <laughs> you don't. You no longer have a private life of any kind whatsoever. Total surrender into God's hands. Um, the room where you dress, the Pope dress, is called the Room of Tears, <laughs> right after being elected Pope. They have three sizes of cassocks there, because you never know which one will be a chosen. <laughs> Some are a little bigger than others. <laughs> like Abraham, he left behind his homeland, his friends, his favorite food, all that was dear to him on the human level. Such obedience of faith led him to a deeper union with Christ in faith and love, one beyond what he could ever have imagined. One of the things about uh, John Paul II, he did all these visits around the world. There were two things that he was always known for. And there was one is he always visited a Marian shrine in whatever country he went to. The second thing was if he went into any church, he made a beeline for the Blessed Sacrament. And you never knew how long he'd be there. <laughs> He could be running an hour and a half late, but that did not matter because he was going to be with the creator of the universe, the love of his heart, and he would spend time with him there until he had this real sense of being one with him, and then he would speak and, meet and continue his mission. St. Paul saw faith as a whole new way of being. We know how Paul's life got turned around. He wrote Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I live no longer, I, but Christ lives in me. Insofar as I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who has loved me and has given himself up for me. St. Paul or St. James describes the obedience of faith in concrete terms, contrasting true faith with its counterfeit. So in his epistle, he writes, pulling no punches, chapter 2, verse 14 and following of James. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? For just as a body without a spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's obedient to what God asks us to do, the mission and vocation he gives us. So faith has these three essential elements. It trusts God completely. It assents to the truth God reveals and it obeys what God asks us to do, it obeys God. When a person does that, he takes up the path of holiness. He becomes a channel of God's love and truth. Doesn't that describe blessed John Paul II? When you and I walk by faith, when we put into action the faith we've been given as a gift, the Lord accomplishes things far beyond what we could ask for or imagine. Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When we say yes to God in faith, we allow the power of his love to work in and through us. And when God is for us, who can be against us? Blessed are those who believed in Christ. Thank you.